to the Pro Bono Happy Hour. I'm Rena Gleaser. Welcome and happy 75th episode. Thank you, listeners, for all your support and helping us grow our podcast. And thank you to all of our inspiring guests who have made our show such a success. Today's guest is Susie Hoffman from Kroll and Mooring. Like us, Susie is based in Washington, D.C. We discussed her career, the firm's pro bono program and foundation, the loaned lawyer program, and more. We hope you enjoy our conversation. Hi, Susie. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's my pleasure. Let's jump right in. Tell us a little bit about your background, where you grew up, went to school, things like that. Well, I grew up in the great Midwest, partly in Illinois, in small towns, and then in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And then I went to school at Indiana University, our state university, and then came out to D.C. for law school at uh, GW Law School. Now, why did you become a lawyer? So it's a good question. When I was in college, I decided I wanted to to do something to make a difference. I think I was on that uh, edge, the sort of the end of the 60s and the 1970s. The Indiana University campus was a, a very progressive social welfare, social justice campus. So I wanted to do something to make a difference. I was deciding between majoring in sociology or political science. And one summer I did an internship that was actually arranged by the sociology department in a juvenile probation department in the city of Fort Wayne. And I shadowed a probation officer who actually was not a lawyer. He was the sociologist, social worker, and got some exposure to the juvenile justice system through working with him. And I found what I liked the most was the the times that we were in court. I really enjoyed the legal part of the internship as opposed to the social work part and then decided that that was an indication that possibly I might want to go to law school. I also, I was in an all-women's dorm and we had a judicial board that dealt with um, problems in the dorm, you know, minor infractions and disputes in the dorm. So I joined the judicial board and was ultimately elected chair. And that also I found very rewarding. And I thought was another sign that law school should be in my future. So that was part of my decision process. Unlike some people, I, from an early age, I hadn't, you know, pined or dreamt about being a lawyer. One of my favorite movies, I do have to say, was To Kill a Mockingbird. And so that may have subconsciously influenced me, but the the conscious process was more of this internship and some of my experiences in college. That's amazing. I'm very intrigued by the intersection of sort of social work and law. And it's something that I'm sure you do, too. I tell a lot of... Our, our undergrads who were kind of thinking about what do they want to do, what track are they on, and really kind of encourage them to think, you know, are, are you really thinking about the social work track? Are you really thinking about the law track? And maybe both combined, but kind of get your feet wet, get some experience and think, because as much as there's overlap, there's also sort of big differences. And it's it's good to be sure. So one of the things when I first, that, that to me, might demonstrate the difference between um, the the social work aspect and the legal aspect was when I first um, started practicing, I I wanted to do volunteer work. I'd I'd always done volunteer work growing up. I'd done volunteer work when I was in college. And so I decided when I started my career as a lawyer, I also wanted to do volunteer work. And I decided that what I wanted to do was something that was totally non-legal, So I volunteered to do hotline shift and counseling at a shelter for domestic violence victims and called My Sister's Place. So I took training on reflective listening and some of the tools that I think social workers use and started volunteering. I did shifts 
a couple nights a month from 6 to 10 where I was on the hotline and also interacted with the residents. And it, and it was rewarding in a certain sense. And then I was asked to um, help a domestic violence victim in, in actually getting a protection order and worked side by side with her through the process and saw how empowered she was when she went to court and was actually able to get the order. And I felt a much stronger connection to her throughout that process, a much stronger connection than I had when I was doing reflective listening and talking to, to victims and letting them tell their story. Because by um, helping victims use these tools, there was like a real sense of accomplishment. There was a sense of empowerment for the victim. And I felt I made a much bigger difference. So to me, that was reflective of my decision-making process of being a social worker versus being a lawyer. Yeah, it's a great personal and professional observation. So thank you for sharing that. Before we move on, I want to kind of call back to something you mentioned that you knew you always wanted to make a difference. That was a kind of driving force in your decision-making. And I'm curious what sparked that, because that led to your developing a passion for pro bono and access to justice. And where, where do you think that motivation to make a difference as a driving force came from? I think part of it was just my upbringing, my, my family. My mother always volunteered. I think she tried for, um, I'm, I'm from a family of six kids, for each of us to develop a social conscience that in some way we should be giving back to the community. Um, most of my brothers and sisters are in the medical or the science profession, so they're giving back in a different way. Um, you know, they're, they're doctors or um, professionals in that respect. So I think part of it was my upbringing. And then again, at the time that I was on the college campus, it was a time where um, I think that the ethos was definitely about giving back, about social justice, about making a difference. So tell us a little bit about your journey and how you got to the firm. So um, I actually chose the law school, uh, GW, that I did because it had a clinical program because I knew that I wanted to do some sort of legal services or public interest law when I graduated. And at the time that I graduated, there, were, there was a lot of competition for the few legal services jobs that were out there. So my career counselor advised me to get a skill. She said, get experience in some area that's marketable. And what I chose was litigation. So I clerked for a year for a judge, and then I went to Hogan and Hartson, which had a really strong pro bono program, and tried to do as much pro bono as I could while I was there, and then began looking for a legal services, um, you know, a public interest job from my position at, at Hogan. And, I, and, and part of the reason that I did the uh, work at my sister's place doing the volunteer work was I also wanted to keep that connection to the community to to learn more about the different kind of legal services that you could provide. And then I, um, Crowell and Mooring created the position of public service counsel. It was the first time, the first full-time legal um, attorney position in the in the district, um, the first position to full time run a public interest program. There, where I'd come from, Hogan, there was a rotation program. So a partner would run the pro bono program, say for three years, and then rotate on, and another partner would run the program. But the Kroll model was that someone would be in the position full time for as, you know, as long as they wanted to stay um, at the firm. So I was, I interviewed for that position, and fortunately, I was selected to become the first public service counsel 
egg roll and mori. And the rest is history, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, and the good news is after I was here for a little over 10 years, they decided to make me a partner. And so even though the position was not initially envisioned as a partner track position, I think because of the work that I was doing here and the amount of supervision of associates that I was doing, they decided to promote me to partner. So I am a partner to this day. Yeah, that's amazing. Let's dig in to your role as public service partner. What does that mean? How do you spend your time? Hmm. So I, I, I do a lot of different things in a day, which I think makes the, the job exciting and always new because I do a whole variety of, of tasks in the day. It's a very people-intensive position. I work with a lot of the attorneys here, talking to them about what their interests are, uh, trying to recruit them to work on different pro bono matters. And so part of my day is talking to attorneys here at Kroll & Mooring uh, about what they might want to do. Um, at the same time, I'm also talking with individuals at legal services groups or potential clients who need help about what their needs are and trying to decide whether we can can take those on. And then there's a whole host of administrative tasks that I do. Um, I draft retainer letters. I, I do what I call approval memos, which is basically a summary of the, the work that we're going to do for an individual. And I circulate that to my co-chairs for approval. I produce a pro bono newsletter. So um, at, at different times of the year, I'll be busy working on the, the pro bono newsletter. I do a pro bono awards event, which um, I, you know, takes a fair amount of time. And I just finished my pro bono awards event, so so I put that um, to to bed for the year. Um, I answer public service questionnaires. I also coordinate the firms. Um, work with the summer associates to make sure that they have interesting projects. And I do a lot of what I say client development is meeting with representatives from new interest organizations or legal services providers to find out what kinds of pro bono matters they have and whether they might be a good fit uh, for the firm. So if you had endless time more time, mm -hmm. more of you, if we cloned you. Is there anything that you wish that you could be doing more of, you know, things on your to-do list that never sort of percolate to the top because you're so busy doing all the things that yes, you've just course. told us about? <laughs> yeah. um, one of the things that I did when I first came to this job, because there were fewer attorneys here, I did a lot more direct supervision of young associates. So, for example, I would work alongside of them or supervise them on a domestic violence case, and I would actually go to court with them when they would do the hearing for the domestic violence victim. And in some instances, in more complicated cases, like in a custody case, I would actually share some of the work. And I would say to them, you know, let me know what part of the hearing you want to do. You know, if you want to do opening and closing and two witnesses, I'll do the rest. So it was enjoyable for me to see their progress and, and mentor them, and then also for me to be able um, to keep my hand in and, and do some actual litigation myself. As we've grown, when I came here, we were 170 attorneys. Now we're nearly 500 attorneys and five different offices. So I don't really have the time to to, to go to court with associates and, and counsel and work with them directly on cases. So if I had unlimited time, that, that would be one thing that I would uh, do again. Yeah, that's a great answer. What do you enjoy most about your job? Hmm, I have to say I enjoy the people most and um, both the clients and the attorneys here, 
And I'm going to give you a little bit of the, my concluding remarks at my pro bono event that will give you sort of a, a sense of what I find gratifying about the job. Um, people often comment that my job must be very rewarding, and indeed it is. Most people, however, believe that it is rewarding because I'm able to bring much-needed legal services to those desperate for help, and indeed that is gratifying. But one of the best parts of my work is that I get to see the good in each of you that pro bono and community service brings out. On a daily basis, I get to see the sacrifices that you make to help others. I get to see attorneys conquer the fear of tackling a new subject matter area when they take on an asylum case. I see attorneys and staff overcome preconceived notions that they have when they undertake representation of a criminal defendant or a prisoner. I get to see the empathy that an attorney develops as they represent a domestic violence victim struggling to find the courage to hold her abuser accountable. I see attorneys work nights and weekends to assure that justice is done. And I'm grateful, grateful that I work at a firm that values the communities where it's based, grateful that we share a commitment to equal access to justice, and grateful that I'm able to work with good people like you. Believe me when I say that one of the hardest parts of putting together the Bailey Awards is choosing among the many of you who I have seen make sacrifices and step outside of your comfort zone to help others. While we have singled out a few of you for special recognition today, you are all heroes in my book. Albeit unsung, you are all George Bailey's. Thank you for all you do and for continuing to inspire me every day. So I think that sort of says what I feel um, about is the most rewarding and, and what I enjoy about my job. Yeah, well, thank you, Susie, for sharing that. It brought huge smiles to our faces. So uh, <laughs> it's just amazing. Really, we're fired up. That's great. Well, so let's take a moment to talk about the flip side. What do you see are the oh, great? Yeah. What do you see as the greatest challenges um, that you face, or that in general people running law firm pro bono programs confront? Uh, in a word, time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And, and it's really on um, a couple different levels. As you alluded to earlier, um, my own time is limited, so there are a million things in the day that I would like to be doing um, and individually meeting with more people because I think that's what's really the most effective in getting people to do pro bono work and making good matches is if I had additional time to really meet and get to know um, our attorneys better. And then uh, time on another sense for the associates and counsel. Um, over the time that I've been in this job, there are increasing demands on um, all attorneys, both associates and partners, for, for their time. The amount of billable hours that are expected of them have increased. So um, to to get people to do pro bono requires extra sacrifices, or I should say more sacrifice than it used to when I first came to this job. So I think that's a challenge is to, to try to find pro bono matters that people can work into their schedules and, and make the time for. So you've been involved with pro bono for, I won't, quantify I'll just say a long time I'll just say a long time now exactly um and you mentioned you know one thing that's changed over the course of your tenure is just the billable hour pressures and sort of the pace Mm -hmm. of practice what else has changed you know as you reflect at law firms and in law firm pro bono um looking back one of the biggest changes that I've seen is the institutionalization of pro bono when I started the job, there were maybe three or four people that were in either even part-time positions coordinating law firm pro bono. And now um, I'm a member of the Association of Pro Bono Council, and we have more than 200 members. And to be a member, you have to be a full-time pro bono professional at a private law firm. So more and more firms have institutionalized this role of, of pro bono coordinator or pro bono counsel. And on the flip side, the legal services providers have done the same thing. 
it used to be when I started the job, the executive director or a staff attorney would call me and say, hey, I've got a pro bono matter. Can you help out? And it would be a different person every time. It would be whatever staff attorney um, had a case that they needed help with. Now, many of the organizations have a designated pro bono director or pro bono coordinator. Like Legal Aid has, Jody Feldman is the, the pro bono outreach person. Children's Law Center has a pro bono director. So more and more legal services organizations either have or are creating this position, and it's a, a full-time position there. So it's led to the professionalization of pro bono. I think more cases are placed um, because there are pro bono prof professionals on, on both ends of the transaction. So in my mind, that's one of the biggest changes that's happened in the, in the law firm and public interest world. Yeah, that's a great observation. Could you share some tricks of the trade or tips for those who are new to their pro bono leadership positions? I think one thing would be to set up a case management and tracking system so that you are able to um, keep track of the data and who is working on your cases. I've, I've developed my own pro bono database so that I'm able to um, obtain information fairly quickly and provide data for the many questionnaires on a, um, a more sort of personal basis, I think that one tip is to try to, to really get to know the, the people at your firm you know, as much as you can to get to know them on a, on a personal basis so that they feel comfortable in reaching out to you and that you feel comfortable in calling them up and asking them to help out with a matter. I am sure that you are asked this quite regularly, but what do you tell people who say, Susie, I want your job someday. <laughs> uh, my goal is to run a law firm pro bono program. How do I do that? What, what advice yeah, do you have for them? I have to say I do hear that a lot. <laughs> um, and what I usually say is uh, pay your dues, which means either spend some time at a, a law firm where you do a fair amount of pro bono so that you uh, learn – uh, the the dynamics of doing pro bono in a law firm, or conversely, go to a uh, legal services organization where you develop uh, certain skills that you can can bring to that you can market to the law firm um, in this position and say, I know how pro bono works because I've been at the Legal Aid Society and I mentored cases for. Attor for attorneys who are at private firms. So develop some skills on, on one or on both sides of the equation. Because I've seen that people come to this position uh, usually in, in one of two routes, either through having been at a firm where they've done a fair amount of pro bono or have been at uh, um, doing legal services and have gotten experience in that realm and then have transitioned over to be a, um, a public service counsel, I think it's hard. Some for um, I think it's hard for students right out of law school or young attorneys to come fresh into the position. I, I think it's the kind of position where you need to have some experience under your belt. Well, that makes me feel much better about the advice I give, since it's very similar. So <laughs> I feel very validated. So um, thank you for that. Yeah. So, so I want to switch gears a minute. I often hear from firms that are debating uh, whether to create a foundation. And you're the president of the, the firm foundation, the Kroll and Mooring Foundation. Right. And I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about how it operates, some of the benefits to the firm of having a foundation. Hmm. So... Running a foundation is totally different than running a pro bono program. Even though they're both doing good in, in the large generic sense, they're, I think, two different skill sets. The, the management in this firm, I think, felt that because it's, it was the firm doing good in another respect, that it was something that I should handle. And 
I like doing good, so I happily accepted the role as president of the Kroll and Mooring Foundation, but it's a totally different skill set. One reason that we created the foundation was that it was a way that we could funnel attorneys fee awards and pro bono cases um, back into the community. In most instances, or in many instances, we worked with cooperating counsel, say for example, the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. So if we got an attorney's fee award, we would donate or share it with the Lawyers Committee. In some instances where we didn't have cooperating counsel, we would get a fee award and, and there wasn't an obvious partner to donate the money back to. In that case, we would put it in the foundation and then our foundation funds our Equal Justice Works Fellows, and it also makes grants to local nonprofits that focus on some aspect of education for at-risk youth. So it's a, it's a little bit different than the focus of our pro bono program, but it's something that the attorneys and the management and the firm you know, feel strongly about and can get behind. But, but we're really, the foundation is autonomous, we're a separate 501c3, and we have a separate board, and our decision-making is independent of the, the firm management. So we get the applications, and we review them, and we as a board discuss and vote on them um, without any input from management. I think that's a really helpful model, yeah, of a firm foundation for people to know about um, and are considering uh, some different structures uh, and um, ways to organize initiatives like that. Mm -hmm. So while we're speaking of foundations, you're also the president of the D.C. Bar Foundation. Could you tell us more about that for people who may not be familiar with the D.C. Bar Foundation? Sure. The D.C. Bar Foundation is the uh, largest funder of civil legal services in the District of Columbia, and our funds come from uh, from different sources. We get an appropriation from the D.C. City Council of over $4 million each year. Part of that money is to fund um, uh, LRAP program uh, for repayment of law school loans, um, another portion of that money we grant out to provide an interpreter services. Both those um, purposes are mandated by the D.C. City Council appropriation. And then the rest of the funds we grant to civil legal services providers in the district, ranging from the Washington Legal Clinic for the Homeless to IUDA to Legal Aid Society to the Children's Law Center. And it's through a competitive um, grant making process the 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 board votes on those. We also receive um, IOLTA money, interest on lawyers' trust accounts. That money used to be a larger part of our budget, but because the interest rate has been so low for the last several years, um, it's a smaller part of the the money that is given in grants to civil legal services providers in the district. And then the last um, pot of money that we um, give back to the legal, legal services providers in the community comes from private fundraising. And we're just wrapping up what we call our call to action campaign, where we reach out to law firms for um, a major contribution year, and we raise over $600,000 in our call to action campaign, and then we in turn um, give that money to legal services providers in the community for them to uh, provide services to the, the indigent and underserved population. And I have to say, as president of the foundation, I feel like I've learned an incredible amount about the different legal services providers in the district because they each submit grant applications that are fairly detailed. And in reviewing those grant applications, I learn about them, their leadership structure, and the services that they provide. Well, thank you for sharing and telling us more about the DC Bar Foundation. I feel like 
it's a gem that people don't always know enough about. So I'm, I'm really delighted to be able to spread the word. Switching gears a little bit, you talked about work for survivors of domestic violence, and I was hoping you could share some other examples of pro bono cases that have been particularly meaningful to you, either ones that you've worked on personally or that the firms handled that, for whatever reason, really speak to you in this moment. Um, of course, as, as you mentioned, the domestic violence cases, I think I I really connected with my clients and felt uh, um, that they were very rewarding because I think I helped them to really change their lives in significant ways. And and many of those individuals have kept in touch with me and sent me Christmas cards, and so I, I know that it's it's had a lasting impact on their lives. But there are other cases, uh, as, as you might expect, that have, that have also been particularly meaningful to me. Um, one of those, and it's unusual, but the reason I like it because it shows the accessibility of the legal system to an individual. We had an attorney who worked with a parent-teacher association of an inner city school. And the inner city school had taken the plunge and decided that they were going to use uniforms. And they chose a a small um, sole proprietor who had this small business to be the provider of these uniforms. Well, it turned out there were a multitude of problems. The uniforms didn't arrive. They were the wrong size. And this small business person was exceedingly difficult to deal with. And our attorney then took that on to try to negotiate with the provider on behalf of the parents. And um, it was just an incredibly frustrating process. So it, it got to the point where the attorney came to me and said, we want to bring litigation. So we ended up representing 98 parents from this school in bringing small claims court cases as a group against this small business person. And the amounts involved were relatively small. Usually, you know, between $75 and $100 was what these parents had laid out for the uniforms. But I liked it because we were creative. We organized on a Saturday sort of a clinic in the gym at the school and told any parents who were interested to, you know, come. We told them what documentation to bring. We had a notary with us. We had almost like a um, a little assembly line with attorneys and the notary to do the small claims court complaints, and then and then we filed them, and we're able to get judgments for um, for all of the parents involved. But the reason I like the case is because. You know, people who normally didn't have access to the legal system but, you know, had a a grievance that was very important to them, you know, $100 to these parents was significant. To help them use the legal system to get relief was incredibly rewarding. So, you know, that's one of the cases that sticks out in my mind. And also had a great team. It also brought together like seven or eight attorneys working together. It was just a great team effort. Thank you for sharing. You painted such a vivid picture. We could see the assembly line, you know, and uh, <laughs> all of the, and you know. We had food, of course, right? Yep. We had donuts and coffee. Yep. Always food and a printer. and <laughs> You can just kind of see it all. Yeah. And that's amazing. That's just great. So what's on the horizon? Give us a preview about something new you have in the works. Well, we're doing this exciting, that's what I love about this job, there's always something creative or, or new or a, a new challenge. And one of the things that I'm working on right now, and we're, we're just launching it, we just had the training a couple weeks ago, is a project that we're working on with the National Immigrant Women's Advocacy Project and a, um, a group called CalCASA in California. And so we now have three California offices, so I have some capacity there. Um, A colleague from NEWAP contacted me and said there's a huge problem in California in that a lot of the uh, 
domestic violence victims and survivors of sexual assault are in the Central Valley. And the bulk of pro bono attorneys are not in the Central Valley. They tend to be in San Francisco or L.A. in the, these other major metropolitan areas. And so there are a lot of individuals in the Central Valley that could potentially get U visas for victims of crime, who give some immigration status, or could get legal immigration status through the Violence Against Women Act, through self-petitions. So working together, we devised this program where social workers and advocates would meet with victims of sexual assault who were referred by the police or by shelters in the Central Valley, and we would pair those advocates with attorneys in either San Francisco or L.A., and they would work together in preparing the U visa application or the VAWA application. It's a totally paper process. A key part of the application is the affidavit or declaration from the client, and the um, we train the advocates on how to tell the story, but of course the attorney will um, revise the affidavit and work with the advocate in, in making sure that it has all the information. We think it has a lot of potential to meet an unmet legal need in the Central Valley, and so to me that's really exciting. Good luck. We will look forward to hearing more about it. It sounds great. I have to say this is based on a case that we actually handled with New App. There was a meatpacking plant in Postville, Iowa, run by agro-processors, and this was in the Bush administration. ICE did a raid of the meatpacking plant and arrested 490 plus undocumented immigrants and started prosecuting and then deporting them. In the process of doing the prosecution, they discovered that there were 20 to 25 um, underage workers. So they were, were teenagers under the age of 18. And in Iowa, and I think probably in most states, it's illegal to employ uh, minors in the meatpacking indu- industry because it's so dangerous. Mm-hmm. So what we did was we worked to get these youth U visas. So we did U visa applications for them. And I remember my, my colleague from New App called me and she said, Susie, can you send me as many attorneys as you can who speak Spanish and know how to do U visas? Can you send them out to Iowa? And this is August. And and I just said to her, I said, There's, this is not happening. <laughs> I said, I don't know. I said, I might have one attorney who meets all those criteria, speaks Spanish, knows how to draft U visas, and is available to go to Iowa <laughs> now at the drop of a hat. So we worked out another plan. We worked with, she was able to recruit a couple legal services groups to help in drafting the affidavits for these youth. And on our end, we worked on researching uh, what you needed to do the U visa applications. We drafted the cover letters. We worked with the local group in refining the declarations or affidavits and in submitting the the U visa applications. And most of the clients obtained U visas, so they had legal status. So using that model, we um, developed the idea for the California Remote Representation Project. Yeah, it's also a great example of, well, I may not have unicorns for you, but we can figure this out. <laughs> we can, we can right. pull in a lot of different players and we can make this work. <laughs> so that's right. Well, that's a- one of the, the great things about the job is it gives you the chance to think outside the box, to think creatively in, in trying to figure out how to meet legal needs. Speaking of meeting legal needs, could you tell us about the firm's loaned lawyer program with the Legal Aid Society of D.C.? Sure. Um, We're one of several firms that I think have loaned lawyer programs, and we send an associate to the Legal Aid Society for a six-month period to the housing division, 
um, where they are totally divorced from firm work. They're not allowed to touch any of the work at the firm, and they work full-time for the Legal Aid Society handling um, a variety of cases, um, eviction defense, affirmative housing condition cases in the, the housing division at Legal Aid. And we, you know, we do it for a variety of reasons. One, to really help Legal Aid extend their resources. But, you know, to be honest, it gives our attorneys great training on your feet experience, case management. Um, they really matured uh, professionally because they are making decisions on a, a daily basis uh, for, on, on their cases. So one follow-up question that I have, because I get this a lot when I'm talking to firms that are thinking about creating a program like this, you know, and, and mm-hmm. sending attorneys to legal services organizations for a period of time, and it always comes up. What happens when their practice group or the partners they're working for don't want to let them go? <laughs> yeah, how do they extricate right. themselves from their um, billable matters? That is a challenge. I can't say that it's not, but we often talk to the PDA's professional development attorney and and say looking at the long-term professional development for this person is um, it'll be a sacrifice to let them go for the six months, but when they come back, they will be much more valuable to you and your practice group because they will have all of this experience. So, it, you know, it's an, it's an investment. Yeah, that's a great way to look and at it. What's your process for selecting uh, uh, people who go? So we initially reach out to the practice group leaders. We send um, the email actually comes from our lawyer development committee chair. He sends an email out to the practice group leaders and says, we're you know, we're recruiting for our next uh, loaned associate who will begin their term in September. As you know, this is a great opportunity to, you know, develop the the talents of rising stars in your group. Please let me know if you have somebody that you think is, um, is appropriate. And then at the same time, I send out an email to associates who might be interested and they come see me and then I go to the practice group leader and talk to them about um, freeing up this person so that they can can go and do the loaned attorney program. That's really helpful to know, and it's, I'm sure, important that it's so married to professional development. I mean, I think that's a great thing for firms to keep in mind. As they're thinking about these programs, That's that's got to be a huge right. component. One of the things that we do that I really try to drive home the point about professional development is I have a, the recently returned loan associate make a presentation at one of our partners' lunches. And I make sure to prep them beforehand to emphasize the, the professional growth that they've experienced while at the um, program. Yeah, it's such an important takeaway, and it's also great that then they get that visibility so that – it, it shines a light on the program and that this is valued and it's important and, you know, this isn't sort of a second-class experience. This is it. This is first-class. This is platinum. Because right. <laughs> we're in investing a recent in presentation, young- I think one of the most effective things that the loaned associate did is she said, I want to show you a day in the life of a loaned associate. Um, and she went through a day where she had a hearing in the morning and was scheduled to do intake for the Legal Aid Society in the afternoon. And and just walking through the number of decisions that she had to make and dealing with some emergencies that came up in one of her cases, by the end of that brief presentation, I could just see partners going like, wow, what an amazing experience. Yeah. And empowering for, you know, on so many different levels. So that's that's fantastic. Mm-hmm. Thank you for telling us about that. Susie, if you had a magic wand, what one thing would you change about pro bono or access to justice? Funding. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I just think that if organizations were better funded, one, they themselves could provide more legal services, but they would also have 
the ability to provide more mentoring so that law firm attorneys could more easily do pro bono. Yeah, great answer. Let's end with this. Susie, who are your pro bono role models and why? So I have to say one of my public interest role models is Rod Boggs, who recently retired from the Lawyers Committee because he dedicated his career to, um, you know, to civil rights and to making a difference. And he did it through engaging law firm pro bono. So for that reason, even though he's from the public interest community, he's one of my pro bono heroes because he recognized the, the power that pro bono firms could, could bring and really marshaled it to make a huge difference. That's a great choice. Thank you for telling us about Rod. Yep. I save this for last, but I ask this of many of our guests to tell us who their pro bono role models are. And you actually were one of our guest answers. So Susie Hoffman. Oh, that's sweet. <laughs> you were identified as a pro bono role model for being so nurturing and caring and willing to help newcomers. Um, so uh, I didn't want to tell you earlier because I didn't want to make you to feel self-conscious. But I feel like we <laughs> have... cheering up. I mean, that's... Yeah. Um... That's wonderful. Yeah, I feel like we have come full circle that we have now had a pro bono role model as a guest. So it's, <laughs> it's really fantastic. Well, thank you so much for talking with me today. It's been a pleasure and very inspiring. Yeah, well, it's been my pleasure. And thank you guys for doing this. Thank you so much to Susie for making the time to be with us. Hey, listeners, we'd love to hear from you. Send your comments, feedback, and suggestions to probono at probonoinst.org. New and archived episodes of the podcast can be found on iTunes and YouTube. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. If you're listening on iTunes, please take a moment to leave a review. It's quick and easy to do. We'd appreciate the feedback, and it would help make it easier for other listeners to find the show and expand the conversation about pro bono and access to justice. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time on the Pro Bono Happy Hour.